Hi, I'm Betsy Love and I'm project manager at the Severn River Keeper Program. And I'm joined here today with Claudia Donegan, who is director, Center for um, Habitat Restoration and Conservation at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and Kevin Smith, who is executive director of Maryland Coastal Bays Program. So welcome my um, good friends and environmental scientists. I want you to know that you're going to be led today by two of the most experienced environmental scientists that, that I know uh, in the state of Maryland. And they have, and the reason I know this is that those two, uh, these two people have helped me at St. Luke's Restoration of Nature uh, understand ecological restoration. And, and that was by complete accident, I'm sure, as I followed them around on uh, their tours of, of uh, other environmental scientists and government and other organizations as they toured St. Luke's um, with those people. And I just tagged along, along and learned all about ecological restoration from them. So I'm excited to have them with you today uh, as we do this virtual tour of two restoration sites. One is before um, restoration and one is after. And uh, our goals will be to, um, you know, to, for, for at the end, for you to know about what, how to recognize a healthy stream versus an unhealthy stream and how to um, determine the source of the problem and why ecological restoration is um, one of the chosen, um, one of the best management practices in um, providing the most benefits for communities and local jurisdictions all around the Bay. So um, without further ado, let's uh, get started. So this, um, this, is the, uh, S this is the Anne Arundel County SPCA Ecological Restoration Project and um, this is scheduled for restoration. And so uh, let's hear from our speakers here on um, why this project is um, actually a, a good choice for environmental restoration. Um, okay, I can start. And thanks, Betsy, for that great introduction. Um, so <clears throat> the, this area is really intriguing. It's ultra urban. It's in the city of Annapolis, you know, the state capital. It is on um, a nonprofit, uh, the, the Anne Arundel SPCA's on the land that they use to um, have a nature trail and they exercise their um, orphaned animals there. And it is um, used by the community quite a bit because there's so little open space um, in, in this area, especially open space that comes to the title interface like this property does. So it's intriguing for a lot of reasons having to do with people and um, you know animal migration and also for water quality to the bay. Um, and, and on top of the fact that for years and years and years people have said that there's a problem here and it should be fixed and um, how do we fix it? So uh, the time has come, there's funding available for design to um, design a restoration project that not only addresses nutrient and sediment pollution to the bay, but also will provide ecological uplift for this little bit of uh, um, forested stream riparian land right in the middle of a very bustling city. Let's see, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and jump in. And, and first of all, thanks again for inviting us to do this. And it's a little weird and awkward. Yeah. Uh, we don't usually do it this way. But, yeah. In these times, it's what we have to do. So, um, so thanks for inviting us. And um, and and I know Claudia and I have both worked uh, to move this project forward, and we're really excited about it. Um, this this one picture that you're showing is actually a bit misleading, deceiving in a way, because when you look at it from an aerial view like this, and you can see the creek coming under Bay Ridge Avenue. Uh, which runs along the driveway to the SPCA, which is kind of at the bottom of the screen, through a forested area and out into a tide marsh and then into Back Creek itself. Um, 
it, it looks like, well, this is kind of a nice forested area, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it does look that way from this aerial photo. But as you get closer and zoom down into the site itself, um, what you'll find are there's some pretty serious problems down there. And most of those problems are uh, a result of a lot of the development that went, uh, that went on in the upstream area with little thought given to, given to um, uh, stormwater management or at least proper stormwater management uh, because the stream, as we'll see in later pictures, um, is in pretty bad shape. And uh, you can kind of see this in this picture as well, but that's at the tidal interface where there's a lot of sediment that's deposited at the head of the channel there. And uh, I know you have other pictures of that, so we'll see it. So again, it looks pretty good, nice forested area from this aerial shot, but once you dive down and take a closer look, um, we'll see some of the issues that are going on here. Let's dive down. This is, the, um, this is at the head of the project, isn't it? This is at the very top. It, you can see there's a pinch point um, here with the stream system, and it's been pinched underneath Bay Ridge Avenue. I can even, looks like that the, uh, the pipes have been bowed. And when it pinches, you know, you get that um, Venturi effect or Benulli's principle or whatever, where the water narrows, it um, picks up speed. And, um, and its power to erode and degrade the stream is increased from that point on downstream, and these are highly erodible soils. So that's what's happening there. Also, one thing about that pipe though, is that if the water, if there is water in the pipe and in the stream, animals, especially young of the year, will go up into the pipe for refuge and even in the, in the area above stream. So it is a conveyance for for aquatic wildlife if it can be. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is um, just a consequence of a lot of, I'll say uncontrolled stormwater runoff. It's there's little treatment uh, upstream. So, um, you know, whatever's going into the stream at the headwaters is, is, uh, is expressing itself further down in the stream system. I don't know what exactly is going on here. I see it has a milky appearance and whatnot, but it could be a number of different things. Um, fact is, is that there's just very little treatment upstream um, to, to address some of the, I'll say, water quality issues that are going on here. But the other thing about this picture and the one before is it also shows how these areas just downstream of these outfalls, you know, get reamed out. Um, because when you get these really heavy duty storms, and we've certainly got our share of them in the last couple of years, you know, these microbursts um, where you'll get inches of rainfall in, in one particular um, uh, short event, um, it can just do serious damage to these stream systems. And you'll, in terms of erosion and in terms of aggregate or um, making that stream a little bit deeper and just kind of reaming it out. So the stream itself doesn't necessarily repair itself over time what it does is degrade over time. So it's, it tends to get worse as opposed to getting better. And, um, and so, and that's what's exactly what's happening at the SPCA. So just leaving it alone is not gonna, is not gonna improve the situation. Uh, it's gonna, it's probably gonna get worse over time as opposed to getting better. And so with this particular project, we'll talk about ways that we can improve that um, in the short order. So this is a, a photo, a drone shot that's taken at low tide and one can see the sediment that flows from that stream out into the tributary here. Yeah, I mean, it, it you know, upstream of this area are um, several housing developments, a major roadway, and uh, through the construction of those projects and um, through years of the stream, eroding you're going to get a lot of this fine sediment deposited right as soon as fresh water and salt water meet there's a little change in the ionization of a lot on the sediment particles and it actually causes sediment to drop out of the water column so you're going to see a big dump here you also are get sediment believe it or not from the susquehanna river that slugs up into these little streams these little tributaries and deposits and, and without a really nice flow from, 
from the, a stream system, you're never going to move that sediment out. So you've got combo effect. And then, of course, these homeowners, you know, that have these piers out here, they weren't the ones that put that sediment there. Some people might think that, but really that sediment has, has traveled there and deposited from two different directions. And then this is really prime habitat for young of the year fish, um, submerged aquatic vegetation, and uh, any interface between land and water and a little system like this is really important to, um, to young a year of anything to hide out and live until it's big enough to venture into the bay. Here's another uh, photo of just um, very close to the tidal interface with the Phragmites. Talk about the habitat for um, for aquatic species in a situation like this with so much sediment? Well, this is, this is actually uh, a growing marsh um, down here. I, you know, as more de uh, sediments uh, move into the system and deposit at the head of tide there, uh, this marsh system is a growing one. And you can really see it in the, in the photo that you showed before where the, um, at low tide, you can see all that sediment that's deposited. As it continues to deposit, they'll probably be more marsh and it will grow further out into the um, river system itself. And while the marsh itself is, is a good thing, I certainly don't have issues with that, but what it is covering is, is what could be good shallow water habitat. And as Claudia said, you know, these, are, these areas are really important for small fish and for anadromous fish to move up over time. And, um, and so, while we may be gaining some marsh habitat here, we're losing really what could be really good shallow water habitat for, for a lot of these nursery areas for fish, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing you see in this picture is in the foreground is a narrow leaf cattail, um, which is a native plant, but you can see in the background, it's Phragmites that's coming in. And what's likely to happen here over time is that the Phragmites, uh, likes a little bit drier than the cattail. So that cattail marsh, as more deposition comes in, as it gains a little bit of elevation, is likely to become Phragmites marsh over time. So that Phragmites will just increase its footprint uh, in that area. And, um, and while Phragmites does have some benefits as a marsh plant, uh, its habitat value uh, is somewhat diminished because it becomes very monotypic. Uh, explain monotypic. Uh, just one one species that's covering the whole area. You know, typically in, in, I'll say, fresher water tidal systems, and that's what you have here. You know, this isn't what I would call a, a real salty situation. You'll get a combination of different plant species, like the duckweed and like the pickerel weed, and, and then you, uh, it'll kind of transition into more salt tolerant species like the alternate floor, you know, Spartina species, uh, bulrushes, things like that. And um, so you, you, you'd hopefully, what you'd really want to see here is a, uh, a diversity of plant species um, as you transition into the tidal system and to a, into a more uh, uh, salt dominated system. And you don't see that here. What you see are it's very monotypic growths, and um, and of course the diversity of plant life lends to the diversity of animal life in terms of providing different types of food and cover, et cetera, et cetera. So, we'd really like to see a little bit more diversity as opposed to these monotypic stands. It's not altogether terrible, um, and it does have some some uh, benefits in terms of nutrient uptake and things like that. Um, but from a habitat standpoint, it's certainly not preferred because if you think about all the different kinds of grasses uh, and, uh, and water plants that would typically grow in an area like this, they're, they, you know, they have different structure to them. They have different um, seeds and, and, and all of these things are, diff, you know, are benefit for different species. So you'll have different types of bird species coming in with different plants and things like that. They'll eat some of the seeds, some of the, um, some of the uh, animals prefer the roots. So, you know, it's, it's diversity makes up this very dynamic um, uh, habitat. And, and that's really what you 
prefer to see and what you would typically see in an area that isn't as uh, degraded to the degree that this area is. Yeah, I mean, Phragmites, it's non-native for the most part. I mean, if it's been around for a long time, but uh, there's another native type of plant, Sinus sororities, which I never pronounce. It looks a lot like Phragmites, but a lot smaller and is more conducive to diverse habitat. And that's why I was saying that the aerial shot earlier is a little bit misleading in the sense that you don't know how disturbed the site is, but when you walk the stream from, uh, say, Bay Ridge Avenue down to the tidal interface, it is heavily and highly disturbed, and that's probably been going on for hundreds of years. Lots of fill activities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, probably some movement of the stream over years. Um, and so this is a really highly disturbed site, and Phragmites loves highly or even moderately disturbed areas. So here's the solution. Let's let's get on to the solution. Here is um, the design for um, ecological restoration. You want to talk um, a little bit about the methodology here? Sure, Claudia, you want to start off? This design concept has been um, uh, instituted or implemented in several sites in um, this I uh, call it geo region, uh, Anne Arundel County, and is found to be successful. Um, there's, uh, it's a very um, excellent approach to creating a, a stream system that reconnects to the floodplain and uh, gently ties it in um, to the tidal interface. Yeah, and I'll, I'll I'll pick up from there. And one of the things that you know, we love to be able to do when we have the opportunity, and this particular project does provide that opportunity, is to really tie, tie the non-tidal system, which is up, you know, basically up to Bay Ridge Avenue, um, down into the tidal system, which is at the, uh, the upper portion of Back, uh, Back Creek where it's, uh, where it's open. And so here, you know, you're able to make that transition from this, non-tidal stream system into this tidal marsh system. So it's really, it's really good that when you have that kind of, I'll say stretch of uh, stream to work with. And what you're looking at here, um, just to point out a couple of things on the plan, is, uh, is a series of, of weirs. And, um, and they're typically cobble weirs. And you'll see those um, weirs that, that basically run up the stream towards Bay Ridge Avenue. And the purpose of these weirs is to do a couple of things. One is to um, pick up the elevation of the stream itself. And uh, you can see it in some of the pictures that you showed earlier, Betsy, um, that the stream itself is uh, incised in the channel and it doesn't get out on the floodplain, particularly in the upper portion of the stream very often, even during some pretty big storm flows, it just stays within the channel. And when all that energy stays within the channel um, during a big storm, you can imagine the velocity, and the, the power of that water going through the system, just eating that stream out. Um, so these weirs pick up the elevation of the stream uh, as it goes through the system so that it actually gets out onto the floodplain much more frequently than it currently does. The other purpose of these weirs is to, um, to allow that water to slow down. So it gets out onto the floodplain, it, it's able to actually reduce the amount of energy that goes through the system because you're spreading this, 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 this amount of water over a larger area. So if you think of like a, um, a garden hose effect basically, where right now it's a garden hose, so a lot of pressure coming out at the end. If you take that, the diameter of that garden hose and increase it exponentially, obviously the power that would go through that is much decreased. Same thing here. So you're spreading that water out. And then the third thing that these weirs do is provide what are called grade controls. And the grade controls ensure that that stream is not gonna incise any further. So really what you're looking at is a system that is not unlike 
what a beaver dominated system may look like. Uh, if we had beaver in here, who in the water throughout this, um, throughout this stream and stream valley. Um, it's a series of dams basically that move through the system. However, these, these weirs are built in a way that fish can move through the system, you know, both resident fish and anadromous fish, you know, things like uh, um, uh, alewife and whatnot, herring that may come up through the system to spawn. So, um, so it does provide them the opportunity to get up into the system as well. Yeah, and I do think that there's a little bit of a misinterpretation of the design concept. If you just looked at it for the first time without any knowledge of the construction technique, that these weirs are submerged for the most part. Most of their structure and the and what they provide is is under and out of sight. They're vegetated on the sides and uh, water flows over them. Um, there has been some some beaver dam BDAs and RSCs constructed that create these isolated pools and that is not what this system will look like it just uh, and then the watering that you see the blue is actually the watering of the floodplain it isn't the actual water won't always be out the way you see it is the design concept um, so some people that don't understand uh, a little bit about this design technique kind of need to be led through the uh, through the design yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point, Claudia, because the, the blue areas that you see as you go up the stream aren't necessarily open areas. These all become very vegetated. Um, and, and, and also a good point about the cobble weirs as well, because over a series, over a couple of years, um, you won't see these weirs. Um, they'll be vegetated. And so um, typically uh, th these are not visible. Most of this work you know, takes place, I'll say, at the water surface um, uh, elevation or below. So these aren't, these aren't, um, you don't necessarily notice them. And, and I know we're going to talk about St. Luke's, and St. Luke's is a great example of this because I'm trying to think, Betsy, how old is St. Luke's now? Two years old, maybe? Uh, yes, it was completed in um, June 2018. Right. So, and if you go there, uh, these weirs, uh, and particularly in the stream system, uh, are mostly vegetated. You, you hardly notice them. This is a, what's termed a regenerative stream um, uh, restoration, uh, RSC. And, um, and, and the purpose here is really to do, I'll, I'll say three things, and they all start with S. And, and that's to slow the flow, to spread out the flow, and thirdly, to soak the flow back in. So you're rehydrating uh, this groundwater uh, that's in the floodplain, which is really important to maintain base flow over the year. So in the summertime, in August, when it's you know terribly droughty and, and dry, where stream systems, you know, typically a lot of them anyway, will dry out because they don't have that groundwater to rehydrate these streams and maintain this base flow. So now you're able to spread this water out over the floodplain, rehydrate the groundwater, and so you have this more consistent and cool flow uh, in the stream uh, year round. And that's really important for fish and other aquatic species. So uh, this is a, an aerial shot of Back Creek. You can see Back Creek um, flowing into, it's the creek that's closest to the mouth of the Severn River there in this uh, and the bay out there. So it's a very close proximity to the bay. And the first arrow is uh, same location and the second arrow is uh, pointing towards um, SPCA, which is slightly off the map. So just to get things in perspective, here we are. Um, you, wanna, you wanted to say something about the um, total uplift of Back Creek in this situation of having these projects here. You had mentioned something yesterday about the fact that um, the small creek is on its way to being 
um, completely restored. So, oh yeah, well, complete's a big word, but um, you know, <laughs> this project on its way. And, uh, we have if once SPCA is completed and Back Creek Nature Park is completed, and then we have uh, um, we as in Maryland citizens and taxpayers have uh, invested in the Living Shoreline at the Annapolis Maritime Museum. You're talking about a creek that's highly urbanized. It's uh, hundreds, if not maybe a thousand boats, and, and right within the state capitol has a, will have some really really interesting um, projects that you can take legislators and um, policymakers and watershed leaders to, and then you're talking about restoration projects that are right on the bay. If you're talking about bay restoration, that's um, a great contribution to the bay cleanup. And Betsy, I'll, I'll just say this picture is, is, in my mind, can be depressing in the sense that you look at it and you think, oh my God, um, you know, this is two little creeks we're talking about in this vast, you know, Chesapeake Bay system of ours. Um, and, and so many of the streams, uh, particularly, you know, in the, in the coastal plain of Maryland and really in the Piedmont as well, are in such bad shape. Um, you know, they're, they're really, they're, they're not working the way that, that they're supposed to work. They're just shoots of, of water, conveying water from, you know, from one situation to the other with no opportunity for processing. And um, so when I look at a picture like this, it's like, oh my God, we've got so much work to do. Um, <laughs> but, um, but the way you get things done, and it's just like, you know, the journey, they talk about, well, you just start off with the first step. Next thing you know, you've gone two steps, and then you've gone 10 steps. And the next thing you know, uh, gosh, we've, we've addressed a whole area like Back Creek. And, um, and so, you know, Back Creek is a very manageable area where we can really do a lot of work and we've done work there and other folks have done work there and um and and i think what's going to happen is you know the next thing you know you're going to say wow we've done all this work and look these are the payoffs and i really hope that you know we'll be able to see these payoffs in the tidal portion of back creek and and you know if other communities and other stakeholders and watershed groups and whatever you know focus on these same things the next thing you know you know, you've made some real progress, so. So here we are at St. Luke's. St. Luke's, um, you know, great site because you had a large amount of property that was uh, managed and owned by a single entity, this church, this Episcopal church. Um, and, uh, and then so looking at historical maps, we discovered that there was the beginning of stream system coming through this property that had been piped and, um, and then a lot of the, the, the watershed flow was in a pipe that was now also run along the road in the background all the way down and dumps right into the tidal interface at the creek. So we saw a way to sort of reconfigure this landscape and um, retrofit it um, to be much more, um, functional in terms of stormwater processing and also ecological uplift what well, just grass is not a great at um yes at processing stormwater <laughs> <laughs> right and much of that grass was uh sediment underneath all, all those shade trees uh along fairview yes yeah, so compacted compacted with an old jumped up pipe Right. And here it's interesting because then when the water does meet, you know, the nice buffer, it was all um, invasive plants that were yanking down the forest canopy. Um, and uh, again, you know, the, the roots of, of most invasive plants are very shallow. They're not going to, um, you know, make the soil more porous so that stormwater can process. Um, and also you're talking about limiting habitat here by offering plants that are mostly from Asia to um, native birds and insects. 
Now this scene, I think everyone's seen along highways everywhere, how mm. these Asiatic bittersweet and porcelain berry and all of that just suffocates trees. Right. And many of the trees were dead underneath all of this when, once we took uh, those vines off. Yeah. And here's the stormwater pipe as um, outfall, as Claudia was saying, entering directly into uh, Back Creek. And, or it's really important, Betsy, to, to point out here that, you know, where the stormwater pipe comes out is down at the bottom of this project area. Um, I know you know, and, and Claudia just mentioned it, is that, you know, there was a stream that went through uh, St. Luke's through that property. And I think you have a USGS map from 1940 something, if I'm not mistaken. 1944. Mm -hmm. It shows that stream that was, that existed there. Right. Because they developed uh, Annapolis and whatnot. And at that time, you know, the state of the art was to put all the stormwater and pipes and get it down to the tidal system as quickly as possible. And that's what they did here. So, you know, all that stormwater that used to run overland uh, was put in a pipe uh, for thousands of feet and then uh, it exited right at the tidal interface, which is, which is what you're looking at here. And um, so this, this project at St. Luke's really offered an opportunity to get it out of that pipe and allow it to process as it moved its way across the landscape and eventually into the tidal portion. The, um, the, the opportunity at, at St. Luke's was really, um, was a great one actually, because you were able to, to get into the system at the top or close to the top of the watershed, because what you would have here would be, and what, what is there now after the restoration is what's called a, a zero order channel. Basically, which means that it only carries water uh, during storm events. It's not a perennial stream. So there's water that carries through the system, but only during storm events. And as you work your way down, um, down the system towards uh, Back Creek and the tidal interface, then it becomes more of a, of a perennial stream, a first order channel, if you will. So, so you're able to really address the stormwater issue from the top down to the bottom. And one of the things that's important to note out, and there's a couple of different um, BMPs that are placed here, um, but it's also important to, to point out that as the contractor was working on this project, um, they did an excellent job of, of um, I'll say, uh, developing additional BMPs where they saw the opportunity as the work was going on. It's really difficult as part of a design plan to know exactly everything that you're gonna get into as you're doing work like this. But as these opportunities arose during the construction, um, they took those opportunities and even in place more best management practices where they saw those opportunities uh, as they were doing the work. So that was really, it was, it was really good that they were able to do that. It also created some issues with the regulatory folks, um, but the fact is, is that it was all um, to improve the water quality and to treat the stormwater that was coming into the system. And stormwater was coming into the system from all around the property uh, through curb cuts and bioswells. Um, and we're gonna see some of that as we move forward here. So here we are at the very top. This is Bay Ridge Avenue. And remember the cross that you saw in the previous photo where it was just grass, as Claudia pointed out. Now we have uh, this bioswell that's vegetated with um, native plants and um, water is underneath this, in a trench underneath. This is a vegetated bioswell. Uh, because it comes out into a perforated pipe into sand and cobble and wood chips, uh, producing groundwater for the next level. Yeah, this is uh, where we were talking about grabbing the water at the top of the, of the system. So the previous slide really showed where that water is coming out of the old storm pipe there. 
Um, and, and again, it's not wet all the time. It's only during, during storm systems. This is a picture um, of that system as you get, I guess, about a third of the way down into the system where now it's becoming more of a perennial stream system where it's holding water more often. And so you're transitioning from this zero order channel, no water most of the time into this um, uh, in more perennial system. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting about this design um, approach and um, some of the science that's kind of coming out now, if uh, you've heard of or read Castro and Thorne Stream Evolution Triangle, where you've got a stream isn't just hydrology, it's geology, hydrology, and biology. And in that, this site, we're seeing something really amazing happening where the stream is evolving um, rapidly into um, this you know, robust ecosystem based on not just the hydrology, but also the geology that was um, put in here to as the foundation of the stream and then the wide variety of plants. I think what we see at a lot of restoration sites is that people don't think about the plants um, as in depth as they could to really get these systems going and, and being much more, uh, providing much more ecological uplift. And that's what you're gonna find at this site is that the plants were a key component to this system being so successful. Yeah, and, and it's a good example of what I was talking about earlier with the different structure of, of a diverse, you know, species of plants here. This is not monotypic. And so, you know, different plants perform and, and serve different purposes and provide different habitats. And you can kind of see the different structural elements of that in this picture. I found it astounding that after three months after construction had ended, there was life in that pool there. There, there was tadpoles and minnows in there. And um, would you like to talk about uh, how life is regenerated there with the coarse woody materials and the water? Uh, well, I just think that um, it, it basically goes back to what I was just saying about the stream evolution triangle and how the ge geology and the hydrology and the biology are all working together, but they're accelerated here because all these, these things were put in, um, in on a basically flat field. <laughs> so um, you've uh, got the ingredients of a, of a great biological experiment here, soup. Um, and, um, and if these animals are in the area downstream particularly, they're gonna migrate up into this, these newly created ecosystems. And the coarse woody material is supplying the right carbon and nitrogen um, combination to feed the system. Um, now I do know for a fact that some of these little tadpoles, well, mostly the mosquito fish were placed in there, but that's part of the restoration too, um, is to, to put some critters back in there and get the, get the system rolling not wait around and you know with your fingers crossed if you think you've built something good um you know plan it with uh exactly. with some microbes and and claudia really brings up a good point and this is actually a good slide showing that but you know what you're looking at here are not only the plants that exist within that system but there's a lot that you don't see and that's a lot of the the coarse um woody material that's there below the surface mm -hmm. that provides um, you know habitat for a lot of these bugs and 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 aquatic organisms you know that are uh, microscopic in some cases um, to feed and of course that builds the whole food chain so you know frogs and whatnot aren't going to exist there if there's nothing to eat and uh, of course they need the insects so you've got to build that system so that it's going to provide uh, food cover habitat for those base creatures at the base of that food chain so it can work its way all the way up. So, you know, when you look at something like this in a picture like this, you can see the two dimensional uh, attributes that are, that are there in the picture, but you gotta think about the three dimensional aspect of it and what's underwater. And um, 
and what's happening below all of that because it's as, it's as important as what's happening above. So for ecological restoration, it's about you know the very base of the system and building a base and a foundation that you know things and living things can thrive on. Now this is this is a great picture because it it definitely depicts the absolute um, you know concept that's trying to be achieved here. Take water and create many little watersheds within a project. Many little areas where you're holding the water up on the landscape and allowing it to process, create habitat, feed the forest, and, um, and hold on to it a little bit longer so it'll sink in and then run it down to the bay. All this water here would have been down, down at the creek weeks ago on a, in a big storm event or maybe days, but here it's providing habitat and um, ecosystem benefits and it and this project does this in several places where it's holding the water high in the landscape for an extended period of time, but not like a stormwater pond. It's, it's moving. And, um, and of course, the plants are allowing it to be much more um, uh, diverse uh, ecosystem. This, this bioswell is rich and full of life here. We call it Frog Alley, um, mm. St. Luke's, because there's so many frogs in there. But... Um, would you talk a little bit about the black color of the water and what that means? Yeah, this, well, this is, so pointing out that this is not the stream itself. Um, this is a bioswale that goes to the stream. It captures water um, from uh, uh, stormwater coming off of mostly, um, trying to think of the name of the apartment complex. Watergate. Watergate. Watergate mm -hmm. uh, next door to the, to the system. <clears throat> And it sits there, and um, and what it does uh, is it it eventually moves its way to the stream system, but not necessarily in the way that you may think. Um, it moves specifically uh, underground, so the system is built so that there's a lot of sand, and 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 it works through seepage. So so the water that's being held in this bioswale. Uh, seeps underground uh, through a series of gravels and, and small cobbles, pebbles, and sands to the stream itself. So it moves, but not over land specifically. And as it moves, it goes underground, and actually there's a lot of processing that goes on there and treatment, as well as cooling of that water. So when that water gets into the stream system itself, it's coming in at 55 degrees or whatever, uh, and a fairly steady state over a long period of time. And this helps maintain the base flow in that stream, you know, during these, these um, uh, droughty times of the year. Uh, so it's great for the aquatics because it gives them a somewhat stable and reliable source of water. And, and the other, the reason your question about the black water itself is that, you know, this is a system it doesn't necessarily move, but you know there's this um, deposition of, of organic matter that's that's uh, happening in the system and becomes more like uh, what we would call uh, kind of like a blackwater uh, swamp or something like that, where you know lots of leaves, etc., are coming into the system. They're decomposing. There's a lot of life going on in here. There's a lot of little critters, little bugs that are eating up these leaves. And, and creating more of a boggy situation over time um, than necessarily a stream situation. And I'm sure that some viewers might be thinking, wow, I bet there are mosquitoes there as well. But you can walk through here in the middle of summer and not be bitten because there's so many predators here uh, in, in, in the water and outside the water, um, keeping everything in balance. Yeah, there's, I, I'm sure there's some mosquito larvae in there, but that mosquito larvae is likely to get eaten by one of the other critters that are in there. It's a, it's a dynamic system, um, and it's, a, it's, it's one that's, that's fairly well balanced. So certainly there's going to be a mosquito, but uh, like you say, you can walk through the system. It's not like you're, uh, you know, you're creating uh, all this mosquito habitat where there's nothing there to eat them. There's fish, there's critters. 
So um, it's, it's very good in the sense that ecologically there's some balance there. Right, very rare to be bitten. Mm -hmm. So here's some beautiful photos of um, ecological restoration happening right before your very eyes. It's so, so beautiful. This road, the pink um, flower in the left corner is rose pagonia. It was, uh, it's a rare and threatened orchid that just popped up um, in our bog. And um, frogs, as you can see, dragonflies and beautiful rushes. These rushes are with the brown flowers on top. It's really pretty to me. Wetlands. The wonderful wetland section. I, um, this has Atlantic white cedars in it and um, eighth grade STEM students always uh, are happy to, to answer the question correctly when I ask about which is more efficient, tree, tree canopy or wetlands at sequestering carbon. And the hands go up. <laughs> really? So it's, uh, it's good that they're teaching this more welcoming of wetlands. Um, you want to talk some more about? Um... I think this is a good example of <clears throat> the weir sections and how they are so um, expertly tied into the landscape that you can see the wetted surface of the weir and you can also see the vegetated part. And in this case, these weirs um, have structure that's un you can't see, which is large rocks that are gonna be able to hold this, this project together uh, under the great duress of being in an ultra urban area and a big storm event. At the same time, you see cobbles and high quality sand that are creating the right environment for the Atlantic white cedars that, um, you know, traditionally were up in these creeks um, were used a lot in the early parts of the, history of Annapolis and shipping and things so we just don't have them anymore and plus the, their habitat got changed so dramatically so this is a real restoration um, e even to that level but but remembering that these weirs are here you just can't see them and um, the water is moving about as it was designed to yeah, it's, uh, I agree, Claudia it's a great example of that and actually so is this one where you can kind of see these weirs um, as they go across the, uh, this picture here, there's one, two, three that you can see. And these weirs um, are the underpinnings of this, of this system in the sense that, you know, if beaver were in here and dominating the system, they would do probably a very similar thing. But what happens today with a lot of beaver dams is that, you know, beavers are great at building dams, um, but these dams can blow out, particularly during these storm system, uh, storms uh, that we get nowadays. And, um, and so in order to hold this system together um, in today's environment, uh, with the amount of water that moves through these systems during the storm events, you know, you've really got to have this, um, uh, I'll say this, this very structural, strong spine that um, that holds everything together and and it's in here you just really don't see it um, you can see the top of it parts of it um, but what's what you're not seeing is what's underground there which is this 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 system this foundation that really holds the system together and, and you do see the marriage of the coarse woody material here but realize that we talk a lot about water and the, um, the increase of precipitation with climate change, but we also have drought. And if your system is based on wood and you get a drought, the wood is then now exposed to air and begins to rot and you end up getting undercutting around your, your, um, your wooded weir. So you, you have to have both. You can't just have coarse woody material being what holds your project together and, and nor do you want it all stone because of course wood, the wood is so important to the ecosystem. Right. So the wonderful thing that I get to observe here is fish in these pools <clears throat> coming up from the um, <clears throat> coming up from the tidal interface down here in the tidal marsh uh, especially in the summer when it's really hot out there you see a lot of fish up here um, I guess seeking shelter <clears throat> or, or food up upstream and, and 
uh, Betsy, just to point out that, you know, what was here prior, you know, was not unlike what was at SPCA, where it was a just a highly dense monotypic stand of Phragmites uh, in the, at this right at the tidal interface. And, um, and, and while, you know, it's important to understand that, you know, particularly when these systems are first put in, you do have to have, show some diligence. And I know, Betsy, you've shown quite a bit of it here to ensure that, you know, this thing is going to get started off on the right foot. So there is some uh, maintenance. Uh, and if you see frag coming in, you want to start it. But you want to get these other plant communities started and, um, uh, and dominant in the system so that it's going to really kind of keep the other invasives, particularly like the Phragmites, at bay. And, and I think it's, it's easy to do that. Well, it takes some time, but, but as long as you have to be diligent in the beginning, and you've probably seen some of that in your work down there where you really got to get on things right away if they start to come in like a Phragmites and things like that. Yes, this was a Phragmites marsh down here. That was the only thing that was growing um, in the, at the tidal interface. Uh, pre-construction and so this looks very very different than um, what it looked like before these were uh, eroded banks um, over here they were incised banks um, and trees were being lost into the water from eating the erosion so this living shoreline is very good uh, for stabilization of shorelines and property and uh, it also has um, there's always fish in that tidal marsh and along the stream here and um, along the creek and um, waterfowl. We have nesting pairs of, of mallards and I'm hoping for a wood duck one day, a nesting pair. Yeah, and like you see that the alternative to this, this scallop design shoreline with the vegetated headland points that have both old roots of trees salvaged from other construction sites and also um, some native uh, country rock in this area is this uh, iron rich sandstone. So there's a couple boulders of that. But the alternative to this and what most people go for in a lot of cases because it's what they think is the most stable is a rock revetment or if they have a previous um, bulkhead, they try to get a permit for a bulkhead replacement. But uh, this to me looks not only more stable and resilient to climate change, sea levels rise and storm surge, water can just roll right over this and roll back out, um, but also how much better it is for people to walk out and sit on one of those rocks or have a beach where you can interact with the water, um, you know, the living edge of the bay, as opposed to a rock revetment or, or a bulkhead. It just seems like a so many places people are missing a, a amazing opportunities by not creating sure interfaces that are more like this. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Claudia. That's, um, you know, I know we're talking about ecological issues and values here, but, you know, one of the things is that in this, a project like this, those folks uh, at Watergate apartment, they couldn't get down to the shoreline previously. No. Um, now they can, and, um, and, and they get a, so, so it really has a great benefit for people as well as the critters and other things. So um, it's really, you shouldn't underestimate that. It's an important part of this whole process. And that's not only getting, you know, these, these ecologic communities, um, uh, giving them a better foothold and chance, but also the, the, the human communities and having them the, or giving them the opportunity to, uh, to interact and enjoy this as well. And uh, we should say that both of these projects uh, benefit the city of Annapolis <clears throat> in their meeting their watershed implementation plan. <clears throat> and uh, the, what, the money comes in from rental car taxes <clears throat> at the state level and doesn't cost the city taxpayers anything. So it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good thing all around for community and um, government. Great. Yeah. It's also good for uh, inspiring 
environmental stewardship and um, St. Luke's built a trail along uh, this project and we see people out there all the time. Um, there's signage along the way and I think it's creating a lot of um, a lot of new advocates for ecological restoration because it explains the process of cleaning water all the way down to the tidal interface. And so we're hoping that today uh, we've created some more advocates for ecological restoration uh, during this tour. So thank you very much, Kevin and Claudia for joining us today. And uh, let's hope this COVID-19 virus is beat soon. <laughs> I'll get out and have an actual togetherness tour instead of uh, here across the internet. So thanks again for joining us. Oh, thanks. thanks for inviting thank us. So fun to talk about these projects. Take yeah. care, Betsy. Love it. Thank too. you, Betsy. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.